Hey everybody, how you doing? And welcome to episode number 83 of the John Riley Project. Today is Saturday, October 19th, 2019, and I am so pleased to have as my guest Miss Jennifer Klein here, a singer-songwriter from Poway, California. How you doing? I'm good today. Thank right. you for having me. Um, yeah, we, uh, we we connected, you know, just through, we had friends of friends, and we kind of had some referrals, and I'm just so glad you made it here on a Saturday morning. Thank you so much. All right, so, you know, tell me about yourself. You're a musician, you've lived here in Poway for some time, you're a parent. I'd just love to hear more about your story. Absolutely. I've been in Poway for around 11 years, mm -hmm. and before that, I was in Encinitas for mm -hmm. 20, so I've been in this area for a very long time. Mm -hmm. We don't need to talk about how old that makes me, <laughs> but we can just okay. talk about other things. Okay. Um, so anyway, I've been in Poway around 11 years mm -hmm. and I moved here when my kids were really young because um, just I came here and I fell in love with it. Just kind of had a small town atmosphere that San Diego. I just, well, that's the opposite in Encinitas. You can't even like pull up to a, a supermarket without finding a parking place. So I came to Poway, <laughs> and um, I just kind of fell in love with that feeling of just small town. Um, I thought it'd be really good for the, my girls, mm -hmm. and I have I have three daughters, four daughters, one step and three right. of mine. And um, so yeah, so that brought me to Poway, and I've been, and bef I was always been a musician. I did play locally around Encinitas. I've always been writing songs. I've always been into music, and so but coming to Poway sort of settled down and really started. I don't know, writing more music. It's okay. weird. Yeah. It yeah. felt good here. You know, Encinitas is a great city. And, and it, Encinitas used to be a kind of a bit of a city in the country yeah. a, a long time ago. long time ago. And then I think all that development east of the five. And I, I used to live on Crest Drive in Encinitas. Whoa. Okay. You know where that is? I, isn't that up like it's on the east of the freeway. Yeah. Yeah. Up by the very top of Birmingham. And I know um, we, I, I, it was back before I was married, it was like four or five guys renting a really old house, and, but go. it was a pretty cool yeah. place. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, it's great. And I like, I miss, I miss the food and some of that stuff because there's yeah. so many good restaurants and stuff. But Poway, this is my phrase. I'd say it to my girls all the time. I'm like, Poway is up and coming. Oh, absolutely. That's what I say. Yeah. Because look at all the stuff that's going on in Poway. Yeah. Poway awesome. is a great city. I'm, I've lived here since 1996. You know, we raised our family here and we really love it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things about Poway is that it's kind of, it is kind of diverse. You might not think it is, but it, you know, like I have my friends that I um, were involved in the church mm -hmm. with, St. Michael's Church. I have all this little group. Then I have my yoga yeah. friends and my... Um, I have actually one of my really good friends just opened a yoga studio mm -hmm. in Poway called Mellow Yoga. Mm -hmm. Get that plug in. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I have all different kinds of, of uh, you know, people and attachments here. Well, you know, it's interesting. You talk about diversity and, you know, <clears throat> diversity means different things to different people. Right. And, and depending on the perspective you look at, some people think Poway is not diverse at all. Right. Because of race. Right. Yeah. But, but on many other spectrums, it's extremely diverse right. community. Right. You know, and I think that's one of the reasons that makes it so special here. Yes. Yeah, you're right. It's a good point. Yeah. Very good point, because I think you're right. The first thing people think is, wait a second. Yeah. That's not true. <laughs> yeah. But that's not what I mean. I mean right. that there's all different exactly types of people. Right on. Yeah. And so, um, you know, tell me about, you know, your your music. I mean, I, I, I listened to some of your videos and watched your videos, and they were wonderful. Very feel-good kind of music. And it was beautiful. And I'm just wondering how you got started as a musician and, and really the kinds of messages you like to, to, to sing about. Sure. Well, um, well, first of all, first of all, I have a friend, Catherine, who put us together. Mm -hmm. She is, if it was up to me, you would, I would still be in my, in my, in my house singing to the universe and no one would know. <laughs> so just, so that's sort of, you know, like that's where I right? come from. My, like, it, I'm not about like, how can I get this out there? I, I mean, it's out there to the to whatever, but it's more about just expressing myself. So she's kind of really helped me, like, actually get it into the world where people could hear it. Right. So that's something that's a little different, I think, that about me. But anyway, um, I, you know, I grew up in a commune. We'll talk about that later. But when I was four years old, I was in this commune. I was on the beach. And I remember specifically saying, I'm going to sing. Nice. I'm a singer. And Good. so it's a clear memory. And then um, throughout 
my upbringing in a commune um, with all kinds of different people, I was surrounded by musicians, incredible musicians. And um, there was always parties and music and um, skits and musicals and shows. And so I was constantly this very small child singing and performing and, you know, just very natural. And then um, at 12, I got a guitar from one of the musicians and taught myself how to play guitar, mostly just so I could sing. Um, I was one of those kids, I, you know, little record players with the mi- plug-in microphones. Yeah. I had one of those my grandma gave me, and I would sing to Barbara Streisand for hours and hours. <laughs> and all the kids awesome. that lived with me in the commune would be like, oh, my gosh, shut up. But <laughs> I did not shut up. Um, so I'd just been singing my whole life. And then um, when in my 20s, um, it started to be really like there were singer-songwriters. Before that, there weren't really singer-songwriters. No one wrote their own songs. Right. You know, like think about even Whitney Houston and that whole – they didn't write their songs. Oh, of course not. Um, and so as a kid growing up, nowadays it's so different. Now anything's possible, right? Oh, yeah. But that wasn't in the in the collective consciousness of people. It really wasn't. Me growing up, you didn't think – about that. That wasn't something that happened. People didn't just write songs and weren't Mm singer-songwriters. And so, you know, it was always like you sang other people's songs or you, you know, that's just what you did. And it was about, could you sing well? Well, in my 20s was becoming really popular. There's all kinds of singer-songwriters coming out, Sinead O'Connor and these kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I just thought, I can do that. I can write songs. And I, um, I wrote my first song about a heartbreak, of course, because I was in my early 20s and um and that's when I fell in love with it I'm like this is how I can express myself yeah this is how I get my feelings out yeah this is how what are the words coming out and it helps me understand what I feel um because it was hard for me to express like just talking about that yeah. um so that was a way that's how it started that's beautiful because because when you when you write those songs about a heartbreak it's mm-hmm. It's emotional, and mm-hmm. like you say, it's like these pent up feelings, and you can un unburden yourself. Yes. yes. But at the same time, you're sharing an experience that other people can relate to because we've all gone through heartbreak yes. in one form or another. Right. And then you build that connection with your audience. And that's what makes it special. Right. Yeah. And I would go to little local coffee shops in Encinitas and just play. Um, I had a couple of different friends I played with sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, and people will say, oh, your songs are kind of sad, you know, in the beginning. And I'm like, right, because at that moment I was because to write a song for me, it's not the same for everybody. But for me, I have to be kind of full of emotion. Yeah. Whether it's positive, negative, whatever it's going on. And then it just comes out. It's not like I sit there and, you know, some people write poems and they yeah. put that to music. Mine is just blah. <laughs> it's the words, the music, everything. At the but same time. It's interesting because you, you, know, you, you hear, see these interviews with other musicians and they'll talk about a song and then that musician will, will reflect on what he or she was going through at that moment in their life. Right. Because it was emotional. It was, mm-hmm. they were, and, and it brings them right back to that place and they right. re-experience all those feelings that they were going through. Right. Yeah. So if I sing one of my songs, I immediately go back to what I was thinking and feeling when I wrote it. Right. And I might, I don't, I don't have to feel sad. Like that kind of a thing, but it's just, oh, okay, mm-hmm. you know. And um, one time, like a couple of months ago, my older daughter was staying with me for a little bit, and I, w- I always practice my guitar and sing in the living room. So she was in the kitchen, and she was going through um, sort of a, a hard time with a boyfriend. Yeah. And I was singing a song I wrote literally 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I was singing mm-hmm. it. And she's like, and it just resonated with her. So yeah. 15, 20 years yeah. ago, I went through something that now she was going through. Yeah. She's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah boyfriends, they ruin everything. <laughs> they, you know, they teach you a lot, you know? Yes. But, it, you know, I, if you don't mind reflecting on a couple other things you said is that, you know, at the time you were getting going, singer songwriters weren't a thing, but you go back maybe like a previous generation mm-hmm. to the late sixties and early seventies, it was a big deal. And then oh. into the 70s, you know, music got more corporatized. Right. And then, you know, in the 80s, we began to see more artists, like legit artists coming forward. Right. You know, that wrote their own material. And I just think that's special. Yeah. Um, and I guess more women. I guess that's probably what was different for yeah, me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it that, you know, I was thinking, when I think of Sinead O'Connor and that, Yeah. you know, even Jewel. Oh, yeah. Well, Jewel. You know? What a great success story. She here was locally. here and I saw her in the interchange. You know, yeah. I went to go see her. Because I was writing songs, too, at that time. And, you know, she was at the little coffee shop. Um, 
Well, I remember in the early 90s, um, I was working you know, for this company and there was a guy that I worked with that lived in Pacific Beach. And he would say, oh my God, you've got to come with me to Pacific Beach and see this young woman and just yeah. sing her song right. She's incredible. And I was like, Oh yeah, you know, I mean, and, and, but then she then she just blew up, you know, like God. like like she, less than she a year. was new. She was different. Yeah, there hadn't been really anything like that. Yeah, you know, and it was organic. It yes. just kind of became. So yeah, that and that was and it was perfect timing, and it was it was all those things. But right. she and she, and she has such a charisma about her. Yeah. So when you see her live, it's like she just she's just genuine. Right. She's just an authentic person. Right. Yeah. So she just kind of comes through. Yeah, well, I think that's that's key, you know, for for an artist to be authentic, because then mm -hmm. it, they become believable, and right. then people can connect. Right. You know. That's why sometimes they'll be like, "Oh, so the music flows through you," and I'm like, "Sure, yes, but actually, it's just more like I feel like this is something just like anyone feels passionate about, you know, how they express themselves. If right. It's whatever, maybe it could be riding horses. I don't know, but for me, this is how it comes out of me. And, um, yeah. And so it's more, it's just, sim it's simple, you know, it's, it's not like I, I don't have like a agenda or like a goal or I'm going to write the song so other people can relate with me. Yeah. I'm going to write the song cause this is how I feel. And of course other people will relate with me because it's coming from my heart. It's authentic. And we all feel right. the same thing. Right. We all have the same, we all have the same feelings and emotions and want to be loved and, right. you know, appreciated and, you know, fulfilled. So. Of course, it's going to relate, you know. Yes, and, and 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 it's it's interesting how in the beginning you at least I would think you know with when you're a poet, an artist, yeah. you know originally you start doing your own thing, but then sometimes you think, well, what does the audience want? And I need to yeah. deliver a message to the audience. And I'm a marketing guy, so my brain thinks that way. <laughs> right. Um, but really, I learned that when it comes to art, you can't think that way. Absolutely well, not. It's you, not genuine. It's, it then it becomes not genuine. And every human being knows that inside. Yes. You know. Yes. That's why people go, oh, I don't trust it. Well, it's because you're feeling some sort of a, an authentic, you know, you're not feeling, yeah. it's not, it doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel true so to your, you. Your spidey senses start tingling, you know, yeah, it's like, it's not that. right, you know, yeah. the little intuition kicks in. Yes. Everybody has that, you know, yeah. everyone knows, you know. Right on. Yeah. So, um. So tell me, um, you know, I, I watched, you know, some of your videos and I, I thought it was wonderful. I, I, the, the lean into joy one yeah. was great. Thank you. And that was, was that in your home or is it? That look, was in my home. Okay. And were those yes. your were children? That the were, older ones were my daughters. Okay. Um, Catherine found some young kids to play my younger daughters. Okay. So it was really cool. Yeah. Um, it was really special. Um, yeah, that song is, it's the, tr the that song um, is a combination of, you know, me um, listening to di some different speakers talk and reading some different books and just sort of like really focusing on um, stopping being present, you know, because there's a lot of guilt with moms, especially with me, you know, when you have all these kids and you're just, you just, you're not enjoying, mm -hmm. you're not stopping, you're just busy and you have, you know, you just get caught up in the um, busyness of life. Yeah. So, yeah. This, that song, my daughter, Lana, she's my youngest daughter. Yeah. And I was practicing my guitar and she came in there and was dancing around the room and um, laughing and kind of dancing. And my first instinct was to literally say, did you do your homework? You know, <laughs> then I'm like, what are you doing? Look at her. She's dancing. Yeah. yeah. And she's laughing and you're here. And so it was a conscious moment to stop. And then I literally just wrote the song about, you know, just about that just stopping and that just you know lean into the joy it's okay to be to feel joyful it's okay yes, yes. To, to feel so joyful give, give yourself permission to do that yes right yes sometimes we deny ourselves oh we know, do we feel guilty about we, it we feel guilty about yeah. it because we just want to have a moment for ourselves to mm -hmm. feel good yeah you know I, that's why this my podcast i talk about it being about life liberty and the pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. well this is part of the pursuit of happiness right right is that to feel joy and to pursue it right um and not feel guilty when you're pursuing it well what, you know when people feel and a lot of people have said this but like you're feeling oh you're feeling joy and you're laughing what our first thought is like oh what's gonna Oh no, this is too good to be true. The other shoe's gonna drop. Right. They always so say, right? Instead of that, <laughs> let's the leaning part is yeah. instead of that, like, no, just feel it. Right. It's okay. You know. So 
that's what that song was. And um, it's just really special because it, it pertains to motherhood more, more like that. But just in general, everyone can relate to. Well, yeah. I mean, especially know. with the visuals that were going on and and you're also playing guitar out on the patio, yeah. uh, the, the porch, I should say. Yeah. And, and that was kind of a classic Americana look, you know, in that. So that was good. You know, yeah. did you enjoy doing that video? Yeah, it was my first music video. Oh, really? I think. Okay. Yes. Um, so it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And where did you record that? It was in my house in Poway. Oh, excuse me. That was yeah. right. I asked yeah, that already. Right in Poway. It's your house. That's a beautiful Old home. Poway. That's where I live. Okay, Old good for Poway. you. Yeah, it was awesome. All yeah. right. Um, and then I saw the video clip of you performing that song at the Belly Up. Yes, and that was so fun. How was that experience? I mean, that's a that's a really beautiful venue, isn't it? Oh my gosh, it was like heaven. So. Any for a musician, when you show up and you have three sound people and you don't have to set up your own sound system, yeah, and uh, it's all done for you, and it's be oh my gosh, that's like my dream. Yeah. So even that part, I know people are, but that was like one of my favorite parts. So yeah, oh, can you turn the mic up a little, and yeah. I'd like a little more here, and it yeah. was so it was like you know feeling like. Uh, Big time. So, but the belly up, I've been going for years and years. I yeah. Mean, and it was always a dream to play there. Definitely always. a bucket list thing, right? It was a bucket list thing. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, it was, I prepared and I practiced and I just, you know, when I got there, I just like mm -hmm. let it go and, and really tried to enjoy it. Beautiful. And I did. You leaned and into joy. I leaned into it. <laughs> and I playing with a full band is so fun because usually I just play with one or two people because yeah. it's just little small little venues so to play with a drummer you know ba the whole thing so you was pulled all these other musicians together yeah. and rehearsed and got ready yes and that's awesome yeah so it was, i love playing with uh talented musicians yeah they for just, sure like, raise the bar you know oh totally yeah so fun and then such a good turnout so that also was really amazing. It's like being here so often, I had all my Encinitas friends and my oh, yoga group was there oh, from yeah. Poway yeah. and my church, you know, yeah. group from was from Poway was there. And it was just, it was really cool. And how long was your set? It was seven songs. Okay. So that's maybe about half an hour. Half an hour. Half an yeah. hour. I was going to yeah. say 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's perfect. It is perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than, you know, doing a gig for multiple hours and oh, yeah. that kind of gets to be a little bit of a grind, right? I do that locally. Like I play at um, Capri Blue. Oh, yeah. Here in at Forest area. Yeah. And um, it's three hours. Yeah. I take a couple of breaks. But, you know, then I'm doing a lot of, I'll do some covers because I know people want to hear that. Of course. And I throw in my originals and what what covers do you enjoy doing oh wow i do all kinds i do um let's see you know some Sinead o'connor mm -hmm. i do um like casey musgrave you know her oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i do a couple yeah. from her just whatever i'm the tom petty oh, yeah, um, yeah. beatles but um the usual you know you, you kind of mix them in for the certain gig but when you're at the belly up you're not doing covers oh. you're doing your own stuff oh, yeah yeah That's absolutely all, all my, oh yeah yeah i did one there because okay. um because uh, it was suggested maybe I do one, you okay. know. So I did, um, like, I'm Gonna Lose You, John Legend and Megan Trainer. Oh, beautiful. All right. And uh, that was fun. It's yeah. just a fun song to do. It's kind of, yeah. you know. Well, it's also good, like, because you, when you're in front of an audience and, you know, some know you more than others. Right. Okay. And some are enjoying your original music. But then it's sometimes good just to throw totally. them a bone so they can find a song yep. and they can you can all connect through a song that everyone knows. Absolutely. So actually that makes sense to do one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I did. And, I, and then I had a guy singing with me. And so it was kind of different. So it was a, kind of a duet. Changed it up a little bit. Right. So that, that worked good. That's great. So, you know, and then <clears throat> I was, um, the other one um, video that I watched was so good. That was so fun. You looked like you had a fun time recording it. I had a great it. time. So it was interesting because, you know, they were, you know, the whole group was there and they're like, you know, Jen, you know, use your arms and stuff. And I'm like, actually, I just, let me just feel this. Yeah. Just let me feel it and express myself and just, and so it was more like just, me really feeling what I felt when I wrote it mm -hmm. and just having fun with it. Like I was, you know, um, singing to a, the person that I wrote it for and, and not thinking about, you know, what movements am I going to make? Yeah. So it yeah. came across as, and they were really great. They're just like, okay, let's do it. That feels more real and, you know, have fun, 
you know, and then he even caught one part where I was like messing around and doing a jig in the middle. Yeah, I didn't even was, know he was recording me. It I'm was like, like an outtake and he kind of slipped it into the video. It in and I thought, okay, <laughs> can't take myself too seriously. <laughs> that was okay though. You're right. Cause it made you real. Doing the chicken dance, but that's yeah, all right. But it was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. There was a line in there and I think I could tell that it was um, what you were feeling and who you were writing it to. And it was, I won't try to change you. Right. Okay. And, it, and you won't have to try to change me. And, and then that allowed us to love each other. Right. Um, and, and I, I, I talk about this whole concept of you do you, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. You know, and, and just feel good about who you are. And then that will naturally attract people that love you right. rather than feeling like you have to control or manipulate them. Right. So I, I thought that was a wonderful, I, that's how I took it, you know, yeah. but I think it's a great message. Yeah. And at the end of the day, and what I'm learning, even after I wrote the song is then it was coming from a place of past relationships where it's like, you are so happy in the beginning and then you start to want to change the things that you loved in the first place. You know, it becomes this weird cycle of trying to make the other person fit into your needs. Yeah. Now it's like, now I realize, first of all, the only person you can change is yourself. Yes. And yes. That's it. hundred percent. And so every time I'm trying to, oh, I, I don't, you know, think about what's bothering me. I'm like, okay, what can I do differently? Mm-hmm. If this is what, how can I, you know, change myself and my behavior and my reactions and um, do that and not focus on trying to change the other person? It's not going to work. Right. No, it's a waste it, of time. It does. <laughs> it leads to frustration and anger. It's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. It's not gonna not how happen. it works. No. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, a lot of these other song titles are great. You know, uh, you know, You Are Truth. What if anything was possible, you know, so a a lot of uplifting themes, but you know, then there's some others where you kind of look on the other side, a Mm -hmm. little bit of passing you by and move and passing you by is about cell phones. So there you go. Yeah. What's the story? um, We were, um, my, my daughters were like 14, 15, you know, they were in that age where phones are literally like attached to them. And that wasn't very long ago, but we were, we were, um, we took a walk with our last dog before he died and uh, we were walking and I said, leave your phones there. For some reason, they didn't have their phones and we just had this really cool walk. And I realized, oh my gosh, like that's rare now because they're so on their phones all the time. And so it was just about, you know, the first word is, do you even know how beautiful you are when you're not trying to record every moment? If that's the first word, you're beautiful. You know, it's so beautiful to see you just in your true natural state. Um, and not, you know, distracted. And the, and wow. I said, time is, pa- you know, it's just passing you by. Yeah, it is. And I, it's hard, for, you know, so it's not, it's just, it was just, just came right out after the walk. I just went in there and wrote it. Yeah, and that's not great because that's <laughs> yeah. the funny thing. Again, other musicians, you'll, they'll have this amazing song and they'll say, well, yeah, I wrote in 15 minutes. Oh, that's usually <laughs> how it works. Yeah. And you're like 15 minutes, yeah. you know, it's the most amazing piece of art. That's all it took. Yeah. But it's, it's that moment you're, yeah. it, it, it captures and then you're like, oh my God, I got to write this down. I got to, exactly. I got to really. Yeah. It's just bubbling. Yeah. Out. So, yeah. And then I think there's some of the old songs that I just recorded that are older that I just never recorded. Right. So I can see the difference in where I was, mm-hmm. you know, emotionally and stuff. There's like more oh, like sad kind of like yeah. longing love songs that I just recently recorded that were written a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. And then some of the more recent ones are, you know, Anything is Possible, You Are Truth. Those are more, they're more recent. Okay. So you guys see the evolution of, yeah. of, of my journey. Right. And where, yeah, where you've been at different Mm -hmm. moments of your life. Yeah. I mean, is there one song in particular that is really special to you? I mean, they all are. Yeah. Um, Just, uh, just for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, There's one song that seems really, really sad. It's called Waste of Time. (laughs) That's pretty recent. (laughs) Yeah. That's right here on the list. Yeah. Um, But it's really special to me because it's sort of like, it's like, I'm so tired of being sad. I'm just tired of it. And it's a waste of time. And that's more in the, in the throes of dealing with marriage and, and child, you know, being a mom and just feeling like, especially as a woman, sometimes you just feel like not appreciated because women tend to take everything on, you know, and (laughs) we'll do it. If it's going to get done right, like we'll just do it. Right. Um, and so as a mom and as a, as a wife, sometimes that's how I felt. And I'm like, this is a waste of time. I'm, and you know, just a reminder to myself when I get, when I was feeling sort of like defeated and just a little bit not appreciated, taken for granted, those kinds of things. It was a reminder to me that, you know, to focus back on 
the joy and and yeah. what I do have and the gratitude and and uh, so it's kind of I don't know why it's just it's special to me that song. Well, yeah, because you when you go through <clears throat> we all go through those rough times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've I've heard other people talk about how life is a struggle, life right, is, right. is a challenge, life beats you down, right, in yeah. various aspects, and you can wallow in that. That self pity. Well, we'll continue to if and, that's what yeah. you're thinking. But you've got to break out of it, <clears throat> exactly, because it, it's a waste of time, right? Yes. And then once you, and it's amazing how you'll be in one of those moments, and just the slightest thing will happen, mm-hmm. and then suddenly your whole perception changes, exactly. and then boom, you're out of the mess, and right. you're onto a beautiful place. Right. Right. Exactly. Isn't that, isn't that crazy how yes. that works? Yes. But yes, yeah, so songs like this remind us of that. Right. And it reminded you of that. Yes. And um, yeah, even a friend of mine was listening and she was like, I was just crying to that song because she could relate so much. Mm-hmm. But it, is, it's, it brings up that emotion, but at the same time, there's a hope there. Right. There's a, there's, a, there's a light, you know? So I like songs like that. Yeah, right on. That's beautiful. Yeah. So um, yeah, so you, you had, your CD is looking for comfort. Yeah. Um, and um, and I, I saw this uh, on your cover page, um, music to nourish your heart and soul. <laughs> Right? (laughs) That's nice. That's a feel good message. I like that. Yeah, I like it too. I mean, I think it's great. Um, So if if you don't mind, if we could just switch up a little bit and maybe, you know, you had shared with me originally, you know, about, you know, the, the, your childhood and and some of the interesting experiences you had living in a communal environment and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping maybe we can explore that a little bit. Absolutely. So what is the most interesting thing you would like? It's such a a huge topic. (laughs) Well, well, the organization that you were um, involved with as a child, it says from three and a half to 16 years, was Synanon. Yes. And I remember I had heard that name before, and then I went and looked it up at the Wikipedia entry, Mm -hmm. and I was like, whoa, this is something. And so, um, and I I don't want to try to describe it because I I would like you to, and just tell me Mm -hmm. about what is Synanon, what was your experience like there? So Synanon... So I can only speak from my experience Mm -hmm. um, because I was a child in the commune. Yeah. So any adult or any other, even a child that's within the same age as me had a different experience. But in general, Synodon started in the late 60s. Um, It was a drug rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And it was in Santa Monica. And it was revolutionary. It was started by a man named Chuck Diederich. And it was basically... Um, it was very positive and popular back then mm-hmm. I, for the most part. I don't have all my facts because I was not born yet. <laughs> but anyway, um, right. but, um, but it was revolutionary in the fact that drug addicts and alcoholics would come to stay in one place in one big house in Santa Monica. And it was cold turkey. There was not – it was just a different thing. They lived together, did everything together, you know, and um, there wasn't like the – what's that they give heroin addicts? The meth – Anyway, that you know that drug they give you to kick it. Yeah, you know it's like they would give you medicine to, to help to kind of wean you off. Yeah, yeah. this is cold turkey. Right. Just you know, so it was revolutionary and that saved a lot of lives. And so, but by the time I came into the picture, um, my mother divorced my dad. Mm-hmm. I was three. My sister was one and a half because she wanted to move into this commune that was going to change the world because right. it was sort of. Hundreds and hundreds of people by this time, saving lives, and you could just come in and live there, and it was sort of this own world. So she did. So she moved in, and I was a very small child, and and um, there was properties in Santa Monica and then Northern California, and immediately she was moved to Northern California, and I stayed in Santa Monica, so I didn't see my mom. I That was it. So that is the part— Wow. So yeah. your father was out of the picture and now your mother well, was- Well, he didn't want to move in. Okay. So he was still there and he would come visit me. Okay. Because you know, he was in Santa Monica area. But yeah, all of a sudden, basically I was an orphan, if you wow. think about it. I was put into a commune and my mom was moved eight hours away and with all these other kids. Oh my. And we lived um, together mm-hmm. and sort of like four to five kids to a room. And we had teachers that were, they were called demonstrators- that's what they were called. And um, they were take took care of us. You know, you you eat we ate together in a huge I can't it's just so a huge topic. So I lived um and but at the same time, there were Saturday night parties every Saturday. There was no drinking in Synanon, no alcohol. There was the rules were no drinking, no no drugs, no physical violence. 
um, and uh, we had there was a prayer and a, a philosophy said every day from Ralph Waldo Emerson, mm-hmm. and based on that, which was beautiful. So I think if if I said the prayer that they said every day, would you want me to do that right it, now? Yeah, sure. I think that would give you a good basis of what I grew up with as far as life. You know, think yeah. this is what I said every day as a child. Let me first and always examine myself. Let me be honest and truthful. Let me seek and assume responsibility. Let me understand rather than be understood. Mm-hmm. Let me give rather than receive. Let me love rather than be loved. And let me give rather than receive. So those are the things that we said every day. So it's a, it's a message of love. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying there was later as it went on, it became, you know, it went down the wrong Way. Yeah. Well, there but was in a, the beginning. Uh, yeah. Well, I, that's what when I read the Wikipedia entry, it seemed like in the very beginning, drug rehabilitation was very successful, transforming yes. people's lives, yes. including people from Hollywood and musicians oh, yes. and actors. And then um, and then it, it changed. Oh, yeah. It, it changed from being um, a drug rehabilitation to really being a commune. Yes. A certain lifestyle. Yep. Maybe even kind of a religion to a degree, it seemed, they right? They tried. That's a very good um, – that actually reminds me of something. When I was around, I think, 11, 12, mm-hmm. we had all moved up to Northern California. And all of a sudden, it was like, we're a religion. I remember being a kid going, this was like, you know, we're, let's call this a non-religion now. Yeah. And even at that age, I've always been sort of a rebel. I was one of the kids I was always in trouble, but only because <laughs> – I was more of like a independent thinker. And right. So I, I knew I didn't like that part of it. Don't tell me what to think. So even as a young kid, yeah, I was. Well, that's good. Yeah. So um, I remember them saying that. And I remember in my head going, um, no, this, we're not a religion. Mm-hmm. And later to come to find out, it was about not paying taxes. Yeah. Because they wanted the nonprofit <laughs> status. And that <laughs> yes. is a. But even as a yeah. kid, I knew it was BS. I yeah. knew that. I mean, it wasn't a religion, but it was very, the teachings were always the same and it, you know, mm-hmm. based on really beautiful things. But mm-hmm. now all of a sudden, you know, so it became, and, you know, as the founder and they got older, uh, his, uh, one of the, his wife died, who was mm-hmm. an amazing lady. And so things just got Well, it, it definitely seemed to take a yeah. radical turn. I mean, yes. there was, there weird. was, um, you know, violence. Um, At the end, it, yeah. it got real weird. Yeah. Um, because it's just something that feeds upon itself. Like, so Synanon, you know, was looked at as weird, you know, in Northern mm-hmm. California because um, at one point everyone had to shave their heads. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I did. Okay. So that happened when I was nine. Did you shave your head? Yes. Really? I didn't do it. Oh, but you didn't. I was, I, I did. I was, but I was made to do it. Okay. I understand. You know, at nine. And your hair is so beautiful. It's, it's like, never uh, being cut. No, <laughs> <laughs> A lot of, <laughs> why, curly hair, Yeah, you know? And it's like, um, that was tough. I looked yeah. like little Shirley Temple when I was little. Okay. But uh, but at nine years old, that's when that happened. It's a it's a very clear memory. Well, yeah. My dad didn't live in Synanon. Mm-hmm. And so I would go see him every other weekend outside. We called it inside and outside. Yeah. So I would go outside and my dad, go see my dad. Well, he comes to pick me up and- my hair is gone and, you know, it upset him. And then he would take me out, in a, you know, with his, to his friends for yeah. the weekend. And, um, it was just very traumatic. That part, that's well, part yeah, that was very traumatic. People were looking at you, you know, I was kicked out of bathrooms. Really? Yeah. In public. Cause I look like a boy. I was, you know, and I'd be like, no, I'm a girl. I'm a girl. Oh. You know, like ladies would see me get out of this bathroom. And I'm like, no, I'm a girl, you know. It seems like we've been having <laughs> this conversation and culture over the last five years and you were going through it when you were a child, yes. you know, about these bathroom police. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, you know, just all kinds of things that happened because of it. And it was pretty traumatic. Wow. Yeah. You know, it didn't have that effect on the boys because they were boys. Well, but yeah. The girls. Well, yeah. I used to dream about my dreams would be like, me having having hair it was that's how much it was well, yeah like, well it's crazy part of femininity you yeah. know and it became a symbol you know that this that meant you lived in Synanon. so in northern california we would go into town petaluma do you know where that oh yeah is? yeah yeah we would go there and you know everyone knew who you were and you were just weird you know it's just i had this feeling of just being different oh. and weird um but i cannot tell you I'm so grateful for my experience. I, Synanon had zero 
zero racism, zero any of that. It, where we grew up in this little bubble was everyone was the same as far as you were all just people and human beings. Right. Um, and so I think for me, instead of growing up in that normal where you have your parents and that's who you're with and yeah. that's what you take on as your belief system and your examples and all that, I had such a diverse people. People who took care of us were changing all the time. And it really learned for me to go inside and figure out who I was. Yes. Because everything around me was changing. And it, it there's a sense of me and the people that are kind of my age is like a very huge openness and openness to all people to, you know, not a lot of judgment. And it's kind of a beautiful thing. I know it was hard, but I feel like on the other end, it really made some like some great perspective of, of life well, than yeah. being stuck with just a small, you know, um, little world. It was a bigger world. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you have greater exposure to all <clears throat> kinds of different types of people. People that were drug addicts that, yeah. and, and talked openly about mm -hmm. their experiences. Um, mm -hmm. So I just saw all kinds of people. You know, it's interesting because you, you think about how we are as an adult and, you know, you, you hear the psychotherapy about, you know, you, you're, when you're a child and how your brain was wired yes. through all of that. Yeah. And that's real. I mean, that's the real deal. It's and you, very real. And you really understand it when you get to become a middle-aged person. Right. Um, so, you know, you went through something very, <clears throat> very different than a lot of um, other other people. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So it greatly influenced you. And I, I would imagine it's being expressed in many forms through your songwriting. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think just having an openness to always grow and learn and, um, you know, question, yeah. question yourself and your thoughts. And, and I don't know, like, like, it's kind of like, I believe inside, like, it's kind of an anything is possible to see. It, it, I don't know, it's an openness, I guess. Yeah. I don't really know how to explain it. But yeah, so, it's different. So in the commune, there was, um, you know, obviously adults that were really, um, you know, either seeking drug rehabilitation mm -hmm. or like your mother, they were really interested in the, in the commune. But as children, were you shielded from a lot of that? Were mm -hmm. you kind of kept a separate or? Well, we were separate in the sense that we were in the school, the Synanon school, uh -huh. you know, but we all ate in the same place. We all, it was, a, it was a commune. There was a huge, 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 huge buildings usually where that all the food service and people would mm -hmm. eat and congregate in little places where you would do activities. Um, a whole nother subject would be the game. Yeah. Which is the... I was going to ask about that. <clears throat> that was the... the Synodons invented the round sitting in a circle therapy. That, right. That's where it became. And um, we grew up doing that. Even um, as children. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for some kids, it was horrible, you know, and, and damaging, I think, too young. For some kids... Like me, I feel like it was a good thing. But then we all have different makeups and different what we can handle, you know. So some kids um, didn't do so well and some kids. Well, the way that I read it, again, I know mm -hmm. as much as the Wikipedia article, which yeah. I admit it doesn't, it may not even be exactly right. <laughs> but um, it seemed like you were to expose some of your vulnerabilities, some of your weaknesses, and then the other people in the group would literally come after you and attack you it could happen. and kind of beat you down. <clears throat> and that was somehow part of the therapy. And well, I, I didn't really understand that. No, I, I get that. And that's what people think. But basically, you have a circle of people, maybe I think 10, around 10 to 12 people. The rule were, was in the game, out of the game. So in the game, it was this place, a safe place, and you couldn't really take it out. That was Right. That's easier said than done, mm -hmm. obviously. But um, in the game, you could say anything you wanted, but you could never threaten anybody. Physical violence. You could never threaten. You could call names, but you couldn't threaten. And other than that, that was kind of the rules. No, you know, no physical anything. Um, and so basically it was a – so, yes, there were times when people would be like – usually it would be like, okay, you'd be in there. And, the, and I got to watch adults do it, which is – it was – so interesting because when they talked about their sex life, I was like 12 and I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh, this is amazing. I'm going to get the popcorn. It was really fun. It was, I learned things probably shouldn't have learned. Right, right. But anyway, yeah. um, but you know, they might say, hey, John, I'm going to pretend I'm in a game. Okay. John, remember, yesterday we were in the dining room. And you, um, you know, you told me that, you know, you didn't like my shirt and that really hurt my feelings, whatever. Yeah. So that might be something to be like, well, it's an ugly shirt, whatever. So they would go back 
And then someone else would be like, well, you know what? You do say mean things to people a lot, you know, and that really hurts people's feelings. This might be somebody else. Mm-hmm. And then, he, you know, so it, it's a way so that there it could be like that um, where or someone could be like really mad at somebody. But then nine times out of 10, say someone was attacking someone. You're horrible. I hate you, whatever, you know. Someone else in the game is watching this and go, wait a minute, let him talk or, you know, he has a point or so I think more often than not, when it was done right, it was actually really beautiful. And as a child, there was times when they would have they would have an adult. Usually they should. Times Mm -hmm. they didn't was not good. Yeah. But they would have games. And I remember one boy and everyone's yelling at him, you never talk and you're so quiet and what's wrong. And then he just broke down crying. I'll never forget it. And he, and it was silent. And this is 20, this is like 15 kids with like 20 of us just watching. And he just opened up about him being abused before he had moved to Synodon by his, his parents. He had been abused sexually and it came out there wow. and all of us were crying and felt, and it was beautiful. And I'll never forget that because that wouldn't have happened for him. And it was, it was supportive. No one held it against him. And we were kids. And so there was times like that. That is very special to have, to learn empathy and as a small child and to see real things that can turn from anger into, oh, my gosh, this is why you're angry. But I'm not going to judge you for being a mean, angry person. Look what we just found out about you and where that's coming from. So from a very early age, you're looking at there's so much more to people. It's not you don't just go that person's mean or that person. There's more in there. Where did, what happened? What was their story? Why are they like this? And right. it teaches you. So, yes. So you could, it would be like watching a video of a game and seeing people, oh, that's horrible. Look at that. But that's such a tiny. Well, because it's been, um, it's, they've used that concept, I know, in movies and, mm-hmm. and people have written books that have taken either about directly about Synanon mm-hmm. or about fictional versions of it. Right. 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 Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to hear from your perspective is the reality versus maybe mm-hmm. the perception, which may be accurate or inaccurate. Right. Right. Depending on who you and talk there to. Was, I'm sure there's, you know, where it didn't work and things that worked. And mm-hmm. like I told you, for me, as a 12 and 13 year old going to the adult games was so interesting. Yeah. So interesting and taught me so much. Right. So did you like look forward to that? Was like a- I kind of did. Uh-huh. So I was a little bit of a weird kid. A lot of kids were like, <laughs> oh, you know. And, I, and, you know, I talked to my mom, mm-hmm. my mom and my stepdad. My stepdad moved in as a heroin addict. That's, he mm-hmm. and saved his life. My mom moved in as a, we call they call them squares. So there's <laughs> dope fiends and squares. Yeah. My mom was a square because she was- I swear she didn't do drugs. She just moved in because she believed in the movement or whatever. Right. So, um, but even I, you know, my stepdad loved the game. He couldn't wait. It was like he got to debate and talk. Yeah, uh, right. And it was like a, it was a, a game, like yeah, literally yeah. like a board, like a game yeah, yeah. to him. Where my mom was like, no, it made me nervous. You know, yeah. was someone going to talk to me? Yeah. It's, so each person was different. And, it, and, and so I, I see all the perspectives of that. But as a kid, I kind of liked him. So by, so by this time, you know, you said originally you were in Santa Monica mm-hmm. and your mother had moved to Oakland. But by this time, when you're witnessing the game, you're up in Northern California in Petaluma. Right. right? Okay. So your mother's there. Well, it's Tamales Bay. We were way in the, and Petaluma was the closest town. So okay. So 45 minute drive. Yeah. So we were at Tamales Bay in the middle of nowhere on 30,000 acres or something. Right. Yeah. So that's... Um, yeah, that's like north of Marin, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, way up along there. the coast. Yes. All right. Okay, yeah, it's a beautiful area, by the way. Beautiful. Yeah. Spectacular. Gorgeous. Um, so um so walk me through this. I mean, you said you were in the commune until 16. Were you, mm-hmm. all that time you were going through this process, shaved head the whole thing, and then how did you eventually not be in Synanon? So yeah, so it's such a long, com- you know, story. So but basically um yeah, with so, a lot happening. But when when I was turned 16, at that point, Sinan was a lot smaller. And they, the person running it at the time, decided that everyone 16 and older, 16 and older would now be an adult in Sinan. They would not be going to school anymore. I was 16. Okay. And at that point, we were going to public school because we didn't no longer had a, a school inside because mm-hmm. there's not enough kids or they didn't want to. I don't even know. But they were sending us to public school. And at that point, I was 16 and I just was like, no, 
that's not happening for me. And so my dad had never moved in, called my dad, see if he could let me live with him and asked my mom and begged her. She had custody, but please let me go. Just let me go. I, I need to be a kid. I'm going to finish high school and yeah. go to school. Um, and I'm not. And I was a little bit protected being in the school. You know, like I told you, it was a little bit separate. We yeah. didn't have to do some of the. Mm-hmm. And uh, she let me go. And my dad let me come live with him. In Santa Monica. No, he at that point, he lived in um, like Half Moon Bay. Okay, so in the Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he eventually moved to Petaluma just to be near me and oh, see good me. Oh, for him. He's amazing. Yeah. He literally, yeah, followed me up there and opened a restaurant just so he could see me. Ah, well, in, that's a good know, dad. He was a good dad. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I was lucky that way. I always had out, I had my dad, I had mm-hmm. my grandparents that would mm-hmm. drive up to, this is a funny story if you want one. <laughs> yeah, my sure. My grandparents, everyone loved my grandparents. Yeah. They adored me. And I think some of the stuff that made me that helped me and helped me survive was this kind of thing. I had these two grandparents that would come to any property any they would drive. They came all the time to the communes to where we were mm-hmm. living and um, sent me packages every two weeks with things I couldn't get. This um, is your father's parents. This is my mom's parents, your mom's, my parents. mom's okay. parents. And um, they would drive up to the, to the commune, all the kids would be like, Jen's grandparents are coming. Yeah. And they would have huge um, bags full of like real milk because we called it cinna milk because it was powdered milk. We okay. hated it. It's cinna milk. Yeah, like cinna nice. yeah. yeah, there's a lot of that. <laughs> um, but anyway, they would bring literally gallons of milk. Yeah. And this is what we were excited about. Well, yeah. And, you know, locks because I loved locks and cream cheese and bagels and like, you know, we couldn't have sugar, but like sugar-free desserts and well, stuff. Well, yeah, that's something. Yeah. And then you know, all the kids would come and they would bring it to everyone and they would, and they just didn't judge. They weren't, they were not afraid to come on the property and yeah. just stay there. And so that was really, really special. But, um, but anyway, I forgot where I was before that. No, we were talking about your father and, and I was yeah. asking, how did you oh, how eventually did out? migrate out? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, yeah. So, so at that time I did do something kind of that no one else had done until then at 16, I just said no. And that just didn't happen there. You didn't tell who was running it. I don't want to name names, but, um, you didn't do that. And so it was kind of a big deal there that I was basically saying, no, I'm This is leaving. your independent streak, yes. you know? Yeah. And there was big games called and things to try to convince me not to. And really? Yeah. And uh, and I just, I did. Okay. And uh, so. But did they, they, they didn't prevent you. It was still your free will to go, right? Well, at the, at the time I was 16 and I was kind of smart enough to know that you can't make me stay here. My dad, my, my mom... She, she, they could have really influenced her and said, you can't let her go. They Mm -hmm. could have, but to her credit, she didn't do that. Nice. She let me go. And then, um, and my dad was willing to let me live with him at that point. Yeah. So all the things. So I had something that other kids couldn't do. So that is true. There were some kids that didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have any parents they could go to. So the kids that were there, it had, you know, if you were 16 and it was, everyone said, you have, you're going to be an adult now. And you didn't have a parent and everyone wanted to go, you you had to stay. But you were an adult, right? You should be able to go, but maybe 16, not. 16, you're not. You, okay, so you're, you're an adult, see, but you're not an adult. Not legally. Yeah. So there were some children there that didn't have any parents to go to. Yeah. Their parents had mm-hmm. moved on or passed or, or something. Or they were both there. Or they were both there, so they couldn't <laughs> escape. There's nowhere to go, yeah. Oh, so did you yeah. have friends that you were with in the commune that desperately wanted to leave but couldn't? You know, not really. No, because they were all kind they of. They were just kind of in there. And yeah. it was, I just knew in my heart that that was not, I mm-hmm. was not going to do that. So what was it like when you got out, what, when transitioning to normal, and I'll put that in air quotes, yeah. life, was it easy? So weird. No, it was not. <laughs> it wasn't like I adapted. The one thing I will say about growing up in a commune in Sinanon is I am an adapter. I can, because just to give you an idea about every two weeks, it'd be like, okay, you guys, they get the kids together, you're moving. 
pack. I had a box that all my stuff could fit in a box. You're moving. I once visited the the property there where there's all these buildings still there. Yeah. Um, I lived in every single one. Like you were constantly moving from properties to this and changing your schedule. And, um, you know, so I change is like, I can do it, you right. know? Um, and so, yeah, it was pretty crazy. But it that's was, all, I mean, forgive me for saying this, but it's almost like a manipulation technique, isn't it? Crazy. You know, to keep you unsettled. Yeah. Right. I don't know if it was on purpose, but yes. Yeah. There's just always, yeah. The people that were taking care of us changed constantly. This is who's running the school now. Oh no, this is who's running the school yeah. now. And, and not, this person says, you got, sometimes it would be like military style. Mm -hmm. When I was little, 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 um, like in Santa Monica, like seven and eight, I remember in the morning for a while, we would get up, have to have our beds made so tight that they would have to drop a quarter. If it yeah. didn't bounce. That's then like boot they, camp. They ripped, <laughs> yeah, it was military. Ripped it. Yeah. I know how to roll clothes like you, no one else. I can roll <laughs> right now. I do it at home. I'm like, kids, you want to see? <laughs> I roll my T-shirts. So everything had to be like that in our mm -hmm. drawer. We had mm -hmm. to, you know, ready for inspection. You know, yeah. so it was like boot camp, very young age. So that would be how it was for a while. And then it would, then it would change to, you guys have so much. You're so rich. Wow. You know, you're going to ride horses and play tennis and. And then it would change back to, so yeah, it was constantly changing. Yeah, but you wonder if that was just haphazard because of the, what was going on with changes in leadership. Right. Or if it was intentionally manipulative to keep you constantly off center, you know? I don't, I, yeah, probably a combination. Yeah. Probably a combination. Wow. And so, but to, to answer when I left, one of the hard, one of the weirdest, I won't say hard, weirdest things was being in a little home where you had a little kitchen and a table. Because I was, my whole life, you lived in a bunkhouse, we called them or whatever. And then the bathrooms were usually separate. It was communal. It was a yeah. bunch of, you know, that's where y'all went. Um, and then you walked, whatever, how many times to get to the big building where you all ate. And you, you know, food service style, like a military, you go through the line, get your food. Sit down. So it was, that's how I grew up. And then all of a sudden I was in this little apartment with my dad. It was just a weird feeling. Yeah, exactly. It was just a very weird. Wait, I'm just walking to the... It was just weird. Yeah, it was. Yeah. How was it just building relationships with your new friends in high school and kind of socially reintegrating? Well, yeah, I didn't... I didn't... My my biggest connections were still to the kids I grew up with. And yeah. by that time, um, there was a few of them that had already left. They were older. Yeah. Like 17, 18. So those are my big connections. Did you go back to visit? Um, send it on. Yeah. I went to see my mom a couple of times, but not much. Okay. Not much. I went to see my mom like four or five years later. Right. Um, when it was kind of breaking down. Yeah. Um, but no, I, and, and mostly the friends that I grew up with had eventually like left. Mm -hmm. And so we were connected mm -hmm. in LA. I went to go live with my roommate in LA was the two girls I grew up with in send it on at 18. That's, that's who I went to go live right, with. Right. Cause you had long standing relationships. Yeah. But as far as going to high school. Yeah. No, I didn't make, didn't make, you know, I was the new kid. Right. And I, at 16, I went to Half Moon Bay and then my dad moved again. And I, I was always starting a new year. Oh. Always. I went to five high schools. Five? Yeah. Well, through Synanon where they moved like three yeah. times. And then I think two after my dad, two or three. Yeah. Two. Wow. So I was always the new kid. So yeah. I never that's hard. made like my reunion, high school reunion. No. In Petaluma, I don't even remember. Well, yeah, yeah. What? No. Yeah, they, there's no emotional connect. Yeah. Our, we're having reunions for our age group and the Sinai age group that oh. we've been having in the last few years, reunions. Uh -huh. And so I haven't made one yet, but I'm going to do it next year. Yeah, I'd be interested in learning how, I mean, you're doing great. I mean, I would wonder, is everyone else doing great? There's some amazing people, like amazing, amazing people that came out. I mean- as I'm learning more and I, through social media and Instagram, I'm following a lot of the kids yeah. that were maybe two years younger than me. That so, well, without naming names, I yeah. mean, tell me like one of their stories, like someone that's accomplished amazing things. Well, I mean, when I say amazing, like um, there's there's a couple of girls that I see on social media that are just very involved in their communities, helping people. Okay. Um, political, making stands, getting laws changed. Oh, right I've on. seen a few of those kinds okay. of um, people. Um, I think there's some people that are involved in the drug rehab mm -hmm. area, you know, helping mm -hmm. people that way. There's just a real sense of, of just good, good well, people. A lot of that's, it was Ralph Waldo Emerson, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that prayer, they're living that out 
to a large yeah, degree, aren't I they? I believe that, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the message in that prayer is very good, but that message in that prayer flies in the face of some of the crazy stuff that, right. you know, so can you comment on any of those, like the crazier stories related to Synanon? Well, there's a bunch of crazy stuff, um, more with the adults, but so the shaving of the head, that's pretty insane, right? Yeah. And that was for years and years, and yeah. that was pretty hard. Um you know, there was something called changing partners at one point where all the everyone in Sinan had to basically yeah. get divorced and get with a new person. Yeah, I read that. I was like, wow. Yes. Okay. But I was a child. Okay. But it was weird from my perspective because obviously my mom. Well, yeah, everything changed. Yeah, and a lot of people left. That's when a lot of people left Sinan. Right. What was the, what were they trying to accomplish? So my understanding mm -hmm. of it is that. Um, the founder, his wife had died and he wanted to get married to, you know, have a new partner. And so he did. And his belief was everyone should do that. So that's crazy. But then there's this tiny little bit of like kind of interesting or validity to some of his thought. So his belief was that if you cherish and love someone, anyone, you will love them. That's just, so it was more mm -hmm. of like an experiment. I know this is crazy. Okay. Of like, okay, you guys, he didn't, you didn't choose for them. Like people chose who they were going to mm -hmm. be with, but the experiment was, okay, now you're with this person. You might not love them, but if you do these acts of cherishing, if you do these things every day to love this person, cherish them, do these acts of kindness, you will eventually learn to love them. Any human being, you can love anybody. Wow. That was, I think, the premise of it, although it's insane to do that. To yeah. It. Well, especially but, if you already love the person you're with, to be forced to leave yes, them. Yes, right. But again, a lot of people left and didn't do it. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, which makes perfect sense. Yeah. But the people that stayed there and did it, um, like my mom and my stepdad today, yeah. yeah, they were together and they had to, they, they changed partners with two friends of theirs. Oh, so, yeah. And now they're back together. Oh, yeah, your mom and stepdad. But my mom, the person that she was with, and she was with him for nine years. Nine? And she loved him. She goes, it kind of worked. I, I yeah. loved him. Well, they probably grew to love each other. Yeah. yeah. And and they had specific things they did as a community of, of acts of love and cherishing to, you know. So maybe the experiment was successful. It kind of, this is the weirdest thing. I, I always ask my mom. Wait, are they? They're still. It's been. They're, they're still. So did they change partners out, and they're still together. She's yeah. like, yeah, most of them are still together. Is that so, the craziest thing? It so is. So on one hand, everyone can look from the from up here and go, yeah. how crazy. Yeah. But on the other hand, okay, like it's kind of like they're still together and they love each other and it worked. Oh, wow. So it's interesting. And my mom and and stepdad got back together. Yeah. After and they. But he said it was the best thing that ever happened to him, too, my stepdad, because he said before that happened, he kind of took each other for granted. There was arguing. Yeah. He goes, after not being with my mom for that long and being with someone else, he just, I've never seen someone like a more beautiful relationship. He appreciate, he, he will, he'll never, yeah. he understood how special she was, and it sort of changed him completely. So to this day, he's so grateful because their relationship now, and it's been 20 years that they've been together <laughs> after they've been, you know, yeah. um, that it was the best thing that ever happened. Well, it's like that. Remember there was a TV show like five, 10 years ago called The Wife Swap? Did you oh, ever see that? Yeah, I did. You know? Yeah, and so they, so yeah, they they end up getting exactly. like put into another family mm -hmm. and, and it's like chaos right, and it's right. crazy. And, and, and then they really have a deeper appreciation for their real partner, you right. know? Exactly. Same thing. Yeah. Just on a much more dramatic scale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And not with the <laughs> video cameras rolling. Exactly. So can you comment on any other crazy stuff with Synanon? Um, uh, I, I mean, yeah. There, there was some pretty ugly, th I mean, forgive me, but there were some ugly things that were in the Wikipedia article. And if you're not comfortable going there, we don't Oh, I'm to comfortable. Do. I can okay. talk about anything. It's just for me. It's my perspective as a ah, child. So, you okay, know, I, you hear know you. I can, right. I understand. I know about the rattlesnake case. I understand yeah. that. I was living there. I saw the news. Um, but from my little kid perspective, oh, yeah. um, things seemed weird. Um, but all the stuff that was going on and the craziness, like I'm sure that there was all these guns apparently that they had bought, but that came from, you have to understand. So as Sinan was getting weirder, 
the um, media was getting yeah. more negative. There was people threatening and there was lawsuits against Sinan, right? The whole tax thing. There's a lot going on. So when that happens to any human or anyone, a collective human, you get paranoid and you start, right? It feeds yeah. on itself. Yes, it does. And so I believe that what happened was that's what happened. And it was like, oh, we need to protect ourselves. People are going to come on our property and hurt us. So let's protect ourselves. So it's this thing of like, it just feeds on it. And so yeah. for me, I was, we were still, you know, playing out and riding horses and, you know, wow, you know, making potions in the, in the, in the woods and <laughs> yeah. playing my guitar by my bed. And, and it, you know, so it was more on the adults that was starting to get weird, you know, like they had yeah. some, you know, they, you know, it's just, it got weird. Well, you were like, you know, you said you were there from three and a half until you were 16. Yeah. So yeah, for a lot of it, you were just a, yeah, just a little kid, you I know? I mean, I was watching it, you know, and, yeah. and some times was, were really hard, depending on who was taking care of the kids and what was going on. And some, you know, some periods were like the best memories of my life, you know, wow. or like just laughing with my friends. And, um, you know, there's a lot of freedom because obviously how do you... How do you, you know, basically, to give you an idea, I would send a schedule to my grandparents. Dear Grandma, Grandpa, here's my new schedule because it changed all the time. You know, 545 wake up, six inspection, you know, class, blah, blah, blah. But there was but there was a lot of free time in there. I had to show up. We had to show up for dinner here. Yeah. Lights out was nine, whatever. But there was a lot of time for us to roam and and make up skits and make up dances. Yeah. And there were still... Um, and then, it, you know, like anything, there were there were adults in the community that were just not cool, not nice. Right. Like there's a few in my head. There's a, some specific adults that really, you know, I have some really like horrible memories about. Nothing horrible like abuse, right, like sexual right. abuse or something, but yeah. but more about just verbal or or manipulation, like you said, or yeah. humiliation. Mm -hmm. um, one time. When I was like 12, one of my friends, we went into town. It was a big deal. We would go into town like 45 minutes away and buy like yummy snacks and just mm. hang out um, and be looked at because we had no hair. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it was fine. We were together. And then um, but one time she was a new kid and she came in as a troubled kid. Her, her dad had moved in as a drug addict and brought his child in and she was kind of troubled. And so she wanted to shoplift some makeup. Mm. And, and to me, that was like, huh? Yeah. Like, yeah. you want to do what? Oh, all right. You know, I was uh -huh. like, you know, so yeah. naive. And yeah. like, I yeah. just, so she took an eyeliner and we got chased out of the store and, but, and we got arrested. I was like, Tom, like, what is happening? So we went to the local police and we're like, we live in Synanon. We're so scared we're getting in trouble. You know, like, this was so weird. And uh, they were looking for things. Oh, what do they do to you there? And we were just like, uh, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they were right. looking for like the dirt. Yeah. Oh, these weird kids we just yeah. picked up with no hair and they're in a commune and they were, you could tell, I remember they really were like assuming that we were these damaged, abused kids and right. that we weren't doing weird, crazy stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember we were sitting there trying to come up with stuff. We were like, ah, <laughs> uh, really have anything. But, but the worst part was that the people that were running the school at that time got the call and they were like, okay, so it's good and bad always, right? There's always both, but they want to teach us a lesson. So we got taken to juvenile hall for overnight. Oh, I was wow. 12. Yeah. In the local juvenile hall to teach us a lesson. So were you like in a, like a jail cell? Yeah. But I'll, I'll never forget it to this day. I was, and I, and it was, you know, they wanted to teach us a lesson and, but I was like the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. And they came to get us the next day. And I mean, I would never think about stealing anything again, obviously, <laughs> but I was never even going to do it anyway. You know right, I mean? Yeah. I was, but, and when we got back, so that was lesson enough. That was a huge lesson. Like even don't even think about it. Don't be with someone that's going to do it for me. Yeah. Look at this. This is horrible. The juvenile hall is horrible. Um, they locked you in a room. It yeah. was, and the kids around me were scary and I had not oh, yeah. been anywhere but my commune, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. And they were scary. And so that was a huge lesson. But on top of that, when we got back to make it to teach us even more of a lesson, they made us wear a sign. A sign? A sign. Like it's like a I scarlet stole. letter. Yeah. And put like clown makeup on our face. It was like humiliation. Oh, I'm sorry you had to go through that. And it was horrible. So those were some of the little things. And when my mom saw it, she 
you know, after a couple of days, my mom saw it and was like, that's, this was going on for a couple of days. It was a couple of days. And my memory says that. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, she asked, you know, that's not, or one of the moms, someone in the community was like, that's not okay. Yeah. And then no, they not did at it. All. You know, they checked the other adults. Though. So there were things like that, you know, but sporadic, all that, there's a lot of good. Like there was a Hollywood director old, that lived in Synanon mm-hmm. who, who used to write musicals and stuff for old Hollywood, like Doris Day and them. He was mm-hmm. a lot older. Well, he would write, huge musicals for the school like full on productions like oh. a story right it's been song. wonderful for you oh I started in every one I was like his little shadow <laughs> he was like oh my god this kid is weird I would not leave his side yeah no one else wanted to practice with him and I'd be like I will and yeah. you know he'd do yeah you know like he would do um god, I wish I can remember one of the songs there's so many songs but he we, we would do full on productions for the whole community Stage, makeup, costumes, original songs. Really? Yeah, he original about the our life in Synanon. So Beautiful. one song might be "Learning to Be a Woman." He wrote this for yeah. us all the teenage yeah. girls. Going, yeah. he wrote that. He wrote songs that were for like the commune about stuff that was going on there. Um, like I don't even remember, but um, but just. That was amazing. That yeah. was like a Well, how many people were in the commune at this time? <laughs> I think at its height, it was like a thousand or more. Mm-hmm. And then I think five, six hundred, I think is more. Like by the time you stayed. left? I think it might have been around there when I left or maybe yeah. a little less. Mm-hmm. I want to say, but it was spread around different communities, like different lo- properties. Right. right. But like, say we were doing a show. I mean, there'd be a few hundred people. Oh yeah, I'm sure. You know, it was a major event for yeah. the for the it community. Yeah, would be like a huge building, and like you were in a regular auditorium. So I was reading online um, that I guess the organization made money by selling promotional products. Yeah. And I was, what was that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I don't know a lot about that, but um, I, my stepdad, everyone yeah. I know, at one point worked for that department. It was like a city. There was automotive food service. There was a dental, uh, there was a medical building. It was a world. If I had to go to the dentist, I just walked up the hill. But it was a Synanon dentist. Yeah. It was on the same property. Yeah. They lived there. Yes. Um, so to give you an idea, but yes, so the, so they did, there was the ad specialty business and they would, um, and a lot of the kids that were a couple years older than me that had to be adults in the community. Mm Mm-hmm. Did that's what they did because the community had to generate income of some kind. Yes, yes. That's how they did it. They did generate a huge income, and to this day, a lot of the people that left Synanon have made wonderful livings doing that. Right on. To this day, it's like crazy. And then my job that I worked to that came out of Synanon too. Um, Mm -hmm. Synanon used to get donations. Went nonprofit. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I remember we would get, we would just be going through of Adidas. Because they changed the color of their stripes or whatever. Yeah. We got a whole thing of Chanel makeup because they went from white to black or black to white. Yeah. Um, my favorite one was the 100 grand bars. Oh, yeah. It used to be with the zeros and they changed it to 100 grand. It used to have all the zeros on it. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I do. We got so many candy bars of the packaging that they weren't going to use anymore. Okay. So that we, so we were always getting donations. My point is, so it's kind of fun. Yeah. We got a lot of airline dinners. We would write songs about that. Airline dinners, really? We get these little airline dinners. We're like, no, I don't want that again. You know, like, little disgusting dinners. Uh, it's pretty, we would get a lot of donations of food and we'd be yeah. like, no, I'm not eating that disgusting thing again. Yeah. But um, that, there was, it was such a huge, don- food was such a huge part of our donations that eventually, um, these companies or manufacturers would be like, we have more and we didn't, couldn't take it. So we would find outlets like, what about prisons or, or, um, you know, food kitchens and yeah. stuff. So it became a huge thing of donating and giving food to people. So you're um, like a triage, right? You'd they'd come to you and yeah. you. And I would have to work it in Oakland. Yeah. I'd be at a, if I happened to be there, we would have to work and help people, you know, just people would come in from all over the city and get food. And take it. So there's a lot of really good things going on too. But that parlayed into a business later where you could get food and stuff from manufacturers that maybe packaging change or yeah. whatever discontinued or was excess and then um, get them for a very low price and then sell them for a very low price to correctionals and actually help yeah. our taxpayers. And it evolved into a mm-hmm. business. And that's what I do right now today. 
Wow. That type of business. Right on. I know. So there so, you go. So, so that's the day job when you're not yes. performing as a musician. Yes. So we all, we all have our day yes, jobs. Yes, we do. <laughs> we definitely do. I'm grateful for it. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, you're a mom. You're a Powegian. You have a wonderful family. Um, you've had an incredible backstory. I mean, my goodness, that's amazing. Um, and a singer-songwriter. I mean, so what are the projects you're working on now? What's big for you today? Um, well, we I just released a second album, mm -hmm. Looking for Comfort. So I think that just happened, like last week. So Oh, wow. Yeah. So just um, with help of Catherine, we're just trying to get that out there and um, have people hear it and listen to it. And so what are some of the themes in, in that album? Well, so like I said, there's my hat, like maybe three or four of the songs are older songs that mm -hmm. I wrote that mm -hmm. I just never recorded. They're more love songs kind of have a sad, like one's called You Lose. Mm -hmm. And that was like very early song for me about a boyfriend, like, okay, you lose. You don't want me what you lose. <laughs> my angry girl song. <laughs> it's like a Taylor Swift song or yeah, something. Yeah, or Alanis Morissette. <laughs> yeah, I like exactly. To say. Um, so there's some of those. Mm -hmm. And then there's some newer, like more inspirational th songs that are more recent for me, like the, um, I think Anything is Possible is on that one. Right. Yeah, like that. And um, so so the theme is more just people and feelings and, 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 Hoping that, you know, people can relate to them, which I think mm -hmm. they can. And um, yeah, just kind of. So if you just out released there. it, so this is new. I yeah. mean, this is great. Yeah. And so you're performing these songs when you're out and about? Yeah. So I, I'm performing October, next Friday, October okay. 25th at Capri Blue. Okay. And then again, November, I forgot the date, but like the third Friday in November. And so that's December. in Forest Ranch, right? Forest Ranch. Yeah. yeah. Um, which a lot of Poway people go to. Yeah. We yeah, go up we'd there go every up once in a while. We Travel were just at, on up the road. We were just at Miguel's for happy hour like two weeks ago. There you go. <laughs> yeah. See? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we play there. And I, the thing is about Poway is I am trying to figure out, there's some new restaurants opening. Um, I want to have live music, you know, um, just community. I'm trying to figure out how to have some community functions to, yeah. to show the new yoga studio of my friend and some art and music. Yeah. And, um, I think that for Poway, I'm trying to figure out where would that would be, you know, and it's something I'm working on that where would be a good place in Poway to have stuff like that, to play music mm -hmm. and, you know, showcase our local. Well, there are a few, people. there are places, you know, where there's live music on Poway road. There's various places where, um, well, Kaminsky's, which is like a sports bar, and then yeah. and then Poway really Irish Pub. Not really indicative to this type of yeah. music. I go to the Irish pub yeah. to dance. Not really going to work for my. I'm trying to, you know. But there's it's more a, like the street fair. You know, is a big street deal. Street fair could work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but but I want like a low, you know, like a place people could just come and well be mellow and. There <laughs> are. Um, you know, I don't know if you're following the news with the whole thing about Stone Ridge, right? That they're going to oh, potentially yes. transform that. And on the drawing board is like a small like community amphitheater that oh, would be there. That'd be amazing. You know, and so they would have like, you know, like these daytime festivals or just, you know, a solo artist to come out and perform. Um, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm kind of like trying to even create. I'm trying to create that. I'm trying to figure out place and make that happen. Well, there's a lot of musicians in Poway mm -hmm. and there's a lot of music lovers in Poway yes. that I'm sure if you can figure out the, yes. the secret code here, yes. that you'll get a lot of people that want to work with you. Yes. I want to do that. And um, yeah, so I'm just trying to like think about that and look for signs and look for opportunities to be more in Poway and really, you know, get our community together in that way. I feel, I feel like that's kind of missed lacking in our Right yeah. now, you yeah. know, so I would yeah. love to, to do that. But for now, yes, I, I do uh, Capri Blue and I do lots of little cover songs and my songs and um, a lot of friends come and and it's it's a good look. It is a good feeling there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm doing that. And um, yeah. So how can people get your music? What's the best way for them to maybe download a song or yeah. check out a video? So um, my website is Jennifer Klein music.com mm -hmm. and then Instagram is Jennifer Klein music same okay. thing and but I am on iTunes just do Jennifer Klein you can just search there's iTunes. another Jennifer Klein I noticed when I was looking seriously yeah really yeah because I because hmm. I was searching you you know when does she we have just... long curly hair no, no. there you go <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know 
<laughs> but well, okay. So, uh, and I'll include the links in the show notes for this podcast. Yeah. So they can connect with you and find and Spotify. your Spotify. I'm on Spotify, Spotify. too. Okay. Um, YouTube, all that. And, right. um, and if you, if you did like lean into joy, for sure you would find. And that's a great video. I really enjoyed Thank that. You. you know, and again, just it's, it's recorded here in Poway. It is in Poway. And it has that Americana vibe, which is, you know, part of Poway's culture. Yeah. So it was beautiful. And all my pictures, people in Poway, if you look at my website, 99% are Poway, you know, the Poway Park. Okay. <laughs> and right the on. roads, you'll rec- oh, I know that road. Yeah, exactly. I know that fence. This so, is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, because one of the things I'm, you know, I said this when we first met before we started the re- recording is that I enjoy talking with interesting people here in my hometown, you know, because there's a, lot of them. there's a lot of great people here that are doing extraordinary things, whether as as musicians and artists or as business people, mm-hmm. as athletes, as community activists. There's a lot of great people in this city. A hundred percent. You know, so yes. it's uh, it's just wonderful to have you here. Thank you. I so, really enjoyed it. So any other final thoughts you'd like to share with uh, the audience here? Um, no, not really. Just, um, yeah, check out my music. Come come watch me play when mm-hmm. you see it. I would love that. And, um, yeah, that's it. Jennifer, thank you so much for spending time here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Okay.